Okay, so I'm driving here, but I haven't been able to to uh, replay my my last uh, recording yet. So I'm just gonna start from where I can remember leaving off. Um, so I have oh, snitching ass car. Man tells you when you're not buckling up. I swear soon they're gonna like have some sort of alert they send to the cops when you're not buckled in. <laughs> Okay, um, anyway, so yeah, I have a a personal stake in the HIV issue, um, I think I kind of got into that with the last uh, recording, well, so my mom, my mom, uh, tested positive, quote unquote, uh, when I was like seven or something. And, um, nobody told me until I was 12. So I didn't know, um, until I was 12. They didn't want to upset me, but my family did just, like, turn me into a complete psychotic germaphobe, and I didn't know why. They, like, I, <laughs> mk altered me about not eating after people and not sharing, uh, drinks and stuff like that. I was a total psycho about it, and I still, I still, it's like, you know, very few people in my life will I actually eat after or drink after, and sometimes nobody, sometimes if I'm just in a certain mood, I won't, (laughs) I won't eat after anybody, it's just gross, um, but my family did that just to try to protect me, you know, without actually telling me about my mom, and, um, when I was 12 and I found out, you know, it's funny, because she'd had it that whole time, but I, I thought that was when the, you know, the clock would start ticking, you know, And I just thought my mom was dying my whole life, you know. And it was weird because she wasn't ever sick. Um, I mean, she didn't feel very well because of the medication. And, I mean, she always said the medications made her sick. Now, she didn't say it to me because, like I said, she didn't talk to me about it um, until I was, like, until I was, like, 21. That's when I finally, you know, actually spoke to her about it because I was too... um, it was just weird because she had, she had not told me my whole life and, and it was my aunt who actually told me and I didn't, I don't know, I guess I didn't want to embarrass her. It was so strange, you know, because back then HIV was like a dissident still, you know, back in the nineties and the early two thousands. I mean, that's kind of how we saw it and it kind of evolved over my lifetime. And, um, anyway, uh, you know, the only thing I can remember, my mom did have shingles a few times. Now that's supposed to be an AIDS symptom, but like I said, the medications give you AIDS. Just like chemotherapy gives you AIDS, well, they are chemotherapy, and they give you, they make you immunocompromised, immunosuppressed, so, you know, it's, like I said, it's a self-perpetuating, self-fulfilling myth, because once they, they put these healthy people that get these bogus positive results on these drugs, voila, after a few years, they do have AIDS. Anyway, um, my mom went off and on these meds, you know, throughout my lifetime, and, um, the longest time, uh, was in high school. Now, here's the thing, I didn't speak to my mom for two years in high school, because I heard she went off her meds, but, because we weren't talking about it, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't threaten her then, it was only once I was older, once, you know, we had actually talked about it, I was like 21, that's when I would start really pressuring her, you know, uh, that if I, if she didn't take her medications, that I would not speak to her. And she would cry, you know, because she said they made her so sick. And she just had a feeling. She had a feeling that she didn't need to be on. I mean, it was her intuition. But, you know, she didn't know a lot of the information I've shared with you. And I wish she did because it was out there. You know, ever since the early 90s, there have been doctors who have been injecting themselves with, with you know, uh, blood from their HIV-positive patients, trying to prove that this is not a real diagnosis, that this is not a real pathogen AIDS is not a pathogenic condition. It is, you know, it, it, it's, it's literally just somebody who's destroyed their immune system. That's all it is. You don't catch it. And um, if only I had known. But I found out just a couple of years too late because my mother, you know, she lived in Texas um, the last couple of years of her life. And... Uh, 
I was busy and I, my mom had been complaining about a stomach pain and I didn't know but like she had been in excruciating pain for like the last year of her life and the doctors weren't helping her they said she had an aortic aneurysm but it wasn't ballooned out enough to do surgery she was on Medicaid so Medicaid HIV they didn't want to help her they wanted her dead um, and that's what they got they got their wish because she died in horrible pain from ble internal bleeding um, and I didn't even get to say goodbye to her. And um, even worse, like a year later, my friend Cody died. It might have been two years later. Cody was only like 20 years old, I think. And uh, we actually had met in rehab, in, that, in a rehab that I went to um, in my late 20s when I was trying to get off my prescription painkillers. I need to make a uh, recording all about that rehab. Let's just say it was an all-black rehab in Jacksonville. Well, at the time that Jacksonville was the murder capital of the whole country. And uh, I'll say, I mean, it was awful trying to get off methadone. But it was a great experience other than that. Because, um, well, I, let's just say that experience is why I, you know, I, I'll never be able to buy into the, to the idea that somehow, like, that black people hate white people and that... You know, that they're just, like, a nuisance, and we'd be better off without them, because I was in, like, the worst of the worst, you know, like, possible rehabs I could possibly gone to in Florida, probably, and, uh, uh, they were awesome, it was just, like, an awesome, I was there for, like, 45 days, and, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I met Cody, and, um, he was there, too, and, um, a lot of, like, I, he was, like, a little brother to me, he was, like, a, you know, my friend, but, um, he was a good-looking kid, and I was, you know, probably, like, the, the only girl they thought that he would have gone for in there, looks-wise, so, um, they didn't believe, like, the administrators and stuff, they didn't believe we were just friends, and they didn't, they knew he had HIV, he was born, supposedly born with it, his parents, both his parents were positive, quote unquote for it they were IV drug users so like I said that factors into the test results if they know that about you a lot of people will get the same exact results and if their historical data they provided is is different and they don't have risk factors then they will be negative anyway his parents were you know both positive and he was allegedly born with it he'd been on the medication since he was like a toddler and the administrators couldn't tell me that uh, that he had HIV because it was like a HIPAA violation. So they were just really crazy, like trying to keep us apart. We had no idea why. Um, they did. They thought I didn't know he had HIV, but I did. That was part of how we bonded because of my mother. And um, anyway, long story short, in the last couple years of Cody's life, uh, he lived with me for a while, um, and he went off his medications, and this was before I knew anything about anything, I was still totally asleep, and, um, he did start getting these infections, like, opportunistic infections, like, he would cut his foot, and, you know, get, like, this horrible disease, and be swollen forever, I mean, you know, he's only 20, so, obviously, I thought it was because of the AIDS, and, um, I ended up pressuring him to get on, back on the medications, like hardcore, you know, taken to the infectious disease doctors. He did not want, he didn't, I don't know, he didn't trust it. Just like my mother, it's like they had an intuition because they didn't know any of this information, you know? Um, but um, I even had my mother force him, you know, pressure him, I mean, to get back on the medications. And I, and I swear when I think back, it's like she didn't want to do it. She was saying one thing with her mouth and another thing with her eyes. I'm the last person that would want to believe that the medications kill people and that HIV is a bogus myth, a hoax. It indicts me in, like, manslaughter at least, you know, wrongful death of two people. I mean, I was really close with Cody. I was, like, one of the, the most important people in his life, so it really did matter that I wanted him back on the meds. Well, guess what happened to Cody? Um, Cody got back on the medications, and I guess they hit him pretty hard because he'd been off of them for a while, and they, um, I think they changed his medications a little bit, and, or upped them or something, 
because he was getting infections. And they sent the medication sent him into renal failure very quickly. And um, he was on dialysis dialysis for a long time. And I guess he he didn't want to live anymore because he thought this would be his life. And he was only 20, and that was not anyway a 20 year old boy who was so full of life. Cody was. Cody was one of the most incredible people you could ever meet. Had a lot in common with my mom, actually. These just hearts of gold. Like He was the person that, I don't care who you were, how old, anything about you, just if he met you, new person, he wanted to hear everything about you. And he was genuinely interested. And, um, yeah, he died because he went off dialysis because he was sick of it died and I died at home, collapsed in the bathroom. I was only like 20 years old. And that was, like I said, within a year or two after my mom died. It was awful. And so, um, and neither of them, keep in mind, neither of them died from, uh, actual, like, you know, AIDS symptoms. You know, they didn't have, like, AIDS-related illnesses. They had a side effect related illnesses and um, anyway House of Numbers really explains it all you know, there's nothing I could say that that documentary doesn't say exhaustively and I just know that I I observed two people that um, like Cody was never sick when he got put on the medication just like my mother he was like three or four he'd never been sick they just forced him on the medication and my mom had never been sick um, she did get sick really quickly after she got on the medications. She had some type of, you know, like within a year of getting on them, she had some type of shingles outbreak. That was like the first one. And they came out, like the shingles came out behind her eye and it was really excruciating. Um, but you know, these drugs and this diagnosis ruined my mom's life and, and Cody's life in a lot of ways because they told them they were dying and there was no evidence of this fact. Uh, well, you know, of this alleged fact. There was no evidence they were dying, but they believed they were dying. You know? That's what this diagnosis does to you. And, you, you know, I mean, check into it. I mean, how many times... How, when have you ever heard of a really, really sick person getting diagnosed with HIV? It's always just a healthy person. They start off healthy, and they get this diagnosis, and they had no idea, and it hits them like a ton of bricks because they were fine. It's just a positive test result. It means nothing. And if you look into the story of Lindsay Nagel, you'll you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, that is a heartbreaking story. It honestly makes me cry every time I think about it. Um, she is featured in House of Numbers. This was before she had her child that they forced her to medicate with these poisonous drugs that almost killed her as a child. That is a very sad story. I won't get into it because I'm running out of time. Please, if you watch that documentary or if you are convinced by any of the information I've provided, if you look into it yourself, please speak out about this because this entire narrative about coronavirus is getting tainted with this HIV bullshit and it's also reinforcing subconsciously, you know, indirectly reinforcing the idea that HIV is actually a real thing that actually causes disease. Like I said, it would be the most pointless bioweapon imaginable because it is not infective. You have to sleep with, like, an infected person 900 times to catch it once. And it doesn't uh, have any effect on the person for years and years and years. So why the hell would they put it in a, a bioweapon? It, it, it's just nobody is thinking at all. And um, I'm just so fed up with it. Um, anyway... Um, one in here now, so perfect timing. Uh, hopefully I'll hear some interesting comments from you guys soon. You know, stay safe. Uh, get some colloidal silver. It's like the number one thing that can help you with this, uh, this virus. Um, and vitamin C, high, high doses of vitamin C to prevent it altogether. Nebulizer. Nebulized colloidal silver could save your life. Alright, bye guys.